Hello everyone, it is great to be with you all again. Unfortunately, we cannot do this face to face, uh, but I think for the time being, the recording should suffice. Uh, before we begin, let us pray together. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, once again for this time that we can spend in your word. Father God, thank you for technology that makes this possible. And Lord, now as, uh, as we look at uh, your gospel, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. And Father God, I pray that when, as we go, we will apply what we learn today in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a well-known story about a man named James, James Marshall. He was a famous football player from the 1960s. During one game, he picked up the ball as it was fumbled and ran it into the end zone, thinking he had scored a touchdown. As he celebrated wildly, he realized to his horror that he had run in the wrong direction. He had scored for the opposing team. Marshall's mistake is still remembered today as the wrong way turn. Imagine his embarrassment doing something with all of his strength and all of his effort only to find out that it was entirely wrong. Friends, as we reflect on our lives this morning, are we running in the wrong direction? Are we focused on what is truly important in our lives? Is God at the forefront of everything that we do? Or have we let other things which are meant for God to take God's place and dictate what we do in our lives? Are we running after money? Are we running after love or fame or fortune? Or are we looking for peace and rest that is never within our reach? Marshall's story captures the heart of the gospel reading today. No amount of effort can save us if we are running in the wrong direction. The rich young ruler in the previous verses thought he had done everything right. But Jesus reveals to him that the kingdom of God is not something achieved through human merit. It is a gift only God can give. The problem we all have of relying on ourselves is solved by God's amazing grace. Please look at our Bible passage today with me. Jesus begins by saying in verse 23, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. This statement draws out a reaction of shock and disbelief by the disciples. They, like many others in their time, and many even today, believed that wealth was a sign of God's blessing and favor. Surely the affluent were blessed by God, which is why they were better off than the common man. If the rich, blessed with numerous resources and success, couldn't enter the kingdom, the kingdom of God, then who could? Jesus then continues to drive the point home with a memorable illustration in verse 25. Please read it with me. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, over the years, there have been many ways that people have tried to explain this illustration. The most popular understanding is that the eye of a needle refers to a much smaller gate in the wall of Jerusalem where individuals could come and grow, uh, go through it without having to open the bigger gate, thus suggesting that the camel or rich person could enter through the narrow gate 
if they were to humble themselves or take off the things that were weighing them down and crawl through the gate. Personally, I have a problem with this line of thinking because it suggests, and I'm sure that Martin Luther would agree with me, that there is still something that the rich person can do for himself to enter the kingdom of God. Perhaps he can share his possessions or give the extra that he makes to the poor or do this or do that. When Jesus says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, he is not employing poetic exaggeration. Jesus means what he says. It is impossible. The law shows us that no amount of wealth or power or good works can purchase salvation. The law confronts us with the truth. We all, rich or poor, run the wrong way when they try to earn God's favor by human means. Think of it this way. Um, imagine a man climbing a ladder rung by rung, hoping to reach the very top only to find that all this time the ladder has been leaning against the wrong wall. No matter how hard he climbs, he will never reach his destination. This is the spiritual condition of those who trust in wealth or comfort or effort. They labor in vain. Just as the author of Hebrews says from our New Testament reading this morning in verse 10, For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Human striving leads only to exhaustion, not to rest or salvation. Can you imagine trying to fulfill even half of the laws that Moses gave the Israelites. The law demands perfection, but perfe perfection is impossible for us to achieve. The disciples respond with a question that we all ask at times. Look at verse 26 with me. Then who can be saved? You can almost see the disciples' desperation and despair as they ask Jesus this question. And this is exactly where the gospel breaks through. Jesus replies in verse 27. Take a look with me. With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. We often fall into the trap of believing that we can please God by doing certain things. If I'm a good person and do good things, God will be pleased with me. Or if I go to church regularly, or if I tithe regularly, then God will look down upon me with favor. Jesus is teaching us that it is impossible for us to please God. No matter how good we are in life, all our good deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord. But all things are possible with God. This is the heart of the gospel. Salvation is a gift of God's grace. It is something we could never even hope to earn or achieve. But God makes it possible through Jesus Christ. We see this divine possibility fulfilled at the cross. Jesus, the perfect Son of God, does what no one else could. He lives 
a sinless life and offers himself as the atoning sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. On the cross, the impossible becomes possible. The unrighteous are made righteous. The lost are found. The dead are raised back to life. Jesus is not saying that the rich or wealthy will never enter the kingdom of God. There is enough evidence of rich people coming to God in the Bible. The point that Jesus is trying to make in this particular passage uh, is that in this life, if we remain focused on anything other than God, be it riches, books or family, knowledge or anything else, thinking that this will be our salvation, then we cannot enter the kingdom of God. It is only through Jesus Christ that we find salvation. John 14, 6 tells us, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is a harsh, harsh saying. It is sad for so many, but it is a fact. Jesus is not only a way to be saved, he is the only way to be saved. And this little fact should cause us to consider how we are sharing this precious saving news of Jesus with others around us. Throughout the Bible, there I mentioned that there were many rich people. Take, take for example, Zacchaeus. Luke tells us that, there were, that he was a tax collector who cheated his own people out of their money. And by doing this, he built for himself a luxurious lifestyle. He realized that he had sinned and needed salvation and that Jesus was the only way uh, and the only person who could grant that to him. He repents and as a testimony of his repentance, he promises to give back everything that he has gained illegally. And look at what Jesus says to him in verse nine, uh, in Luke 19, verse nine. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Today salvation has come to this house. Chuck Colson, the founder of Prison Fellowship, lived a very, very interesting life. Colson, once a, a high-powered political operative, caught in the Watergate scandal, thought that he had everything. Wealth power and influence. But after being arrested, he hit rock bottom. It was in a prison cell, stripped of all of his, all of his achievements, that Colson finally found Christ. He later said that his prison experience was the best thing that ever happened to him because it taught him that God's grace could accomplish what he never could for himself and that was true freedom and salvation. Just as Jesus tells his disciples that it's impossible for man to achieve salvation, Colson discovered that only when everything else was taken away did he realize that God's grace was sufficient for him. As we move along in our text, Peter, always quick to speak, reminds Jesus uh, in verse 28. He says, see, we have left everything and have followed you. And Jesus responds with an amazing promise. He says, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake 
and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus assures his disciples and us that whatever we sacrifice for his sake will be abundantly repaid. The blessings of following Christ may not come uh, in the form of earthly wealth, but they come in the form of relationships, spiritual family, and eternal life. All of us have sacrificed. Some of us have left behind friends and family to be here. Some of us have left wealth or other things. When Samantha, Abby, and I first came to Florida, we left behind everything to come here and to serve where the Lord was leading us. Yet from the very first day, we never felt that we were without a family because you were our family. You opened up your hearts and homes and lives to us and we just fit right in like we had always belonged. Samantha and I were also worried about Abby and Ellie uh, not knowing uh, the love of their grandparents because they were so far away. But we thank our Heavenly Father for blessing them with numerous grandmas and grandpas and even great grandmothers. Abby has been telling everyone here that Isla is her favorite Gigi. And not just them, but Samantha and I have gained friends. We've gained uncles and aunts, mothers and fathers. God has indeed given us a hundredfold, not just in relationships, but in, in possessions as well. We were so generously given uh, a car, uh, furniture, kitchen supplies, and so much more. This is how it is in God's kingdom. What looks like loss, giving up wealth, status, or comfort leads to the greater gain of eternal life and fellowship with Christ. Even persecutions, though uh, painful, are a reminder that we are united with Christ in his suffering as well as in his glory. Jesus concludes this, this passage with a profound truth. He says, But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the great reversal of God's kingdom. Those who rely on their own achievements will be humbled. But those who humbly trust in God's grace will be exalted. This reversal challenges us to evaluate where we place our hope. Is our hope in God, in Jesus? Or is our hope in wealth or status or anything else? Have we surrendered trusting that God's grace is sufficient. Jim Marshall, the football player, never stopped being embarrassed by his wrong way run. But he didn't quit. He was resilient. He kept playing. And in time, he was remembered not just for his mistake, but for his resilience and achievements in the game. In a similar way, God doesn't leave us in our failures. Though we run away at times, His grace meets us. It turns us around and makes the impossible possible. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news of Mark 23 to 31. Salvation is not something that we achieve. 
It is a gift from God. Even when we've run in the wrong direction, Christ welcomes us back with open arms. God has given us a great many things in this world. Our talents, our money, even relationships. But none of these can buy our way to God. It's a curious thing, this reversal, when we offer our trust first to Him, life gets so much better. Abundant life is in Jesus. And when we put our trust in Him, we find joy in giving ourselves and what we have to Him because we are thankful. We are grateful. The kingdom of God is not a human achievement. It is a gift from God. Thanks be to God who loves us so generously. May we follow him and show the generous heart of God to those who need to know him through us. Amen. Let us pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came into this world to die for our sins. Father God, we thank you that it is only through him that we are saved. Father God, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes focused on him and him alone and not to trust in anything else to save us. We ask for all of this in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen.